The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Monday, September 15th, 2014. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Monday Night Question and Answer program during this time. Each person is invited to contact us in one of the ways that were mentioned, and we'll be glad to take your call and your question or comment. And I'll try to respond as much as I can by turning to the Bible, as the Bible is God's holy book. And it is there that we find our answers. If the Lord is inclined, if it's his will to give us an answer on a particular question, well, uh, we only have a short time together tonight, so we're going to get started right away by going to the first person on the phone. Welcome to our Monday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Um, yes, 2 Corinthians 5.10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says... For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Um, we've been talking lately that the we refers to the believers based on all the other verses also before. Um, so the believer is receiving something that is that he's done good and bad? How can that be? Well, well, yeah, uh, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, I have mentioned that all the previous verses in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 9, where we find um, plural personal pronouns, uh, we or are or us, in every single case they refer to true believers. I haven't mentioned that even after verse 10, if we continue reading in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And who would that be but the true believers? But we are made manifest unto God. And then verse 12, for we commend not ourselves again unto you. Again, all the, the plural pronouns are referring to believers. Verse 13, for whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, which again, us would be the believers, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Again, true believers. Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we, no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. And so on, all the way through the chapter, I, I wasn't able to find a single instance or a single verse where us, are or we referred to anyone in these 21 verses of 2 Corinthians 5 other than true believers. So that would even, uh, if the we in 2 Corinthians 5.10 somehow were not the true believers, it would be just uh, completely out of the context of the whole chapter, where every other reference to we, us, or are is to true believers, and that can be determined by the statements in each one of the verses, and it's not that hard to see. So yes, we, the child of God, God's elect, must appear, be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, and then in the last part of the verse, that everyone may receive the things done in 
his body or in body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. That is, the judgment of God, God the judge, is going to make a determination. He's going to decide, and that's really what what a judge does. A judge hears the evidence, hears the case, and the judge makes a decision, like Pilate. Pilate um, had the Lord before him, questioned him, and his decision was, I find no fault in this man. And, and, And so he could have found, as he examined Christ, he could have found some sin, some something bad, but he did not. He found him innocent. He found him good. And having done nothing worthy of punishment, uh, of, of uh, certainly crucifixion, yet it was the determinate counsel of God that Jesus do go to the cross. And, and so the situation... Um, the people were demanding it, and, and Pilate couldn't see any way out of it politically, so he turned Christ over to be crucified. And uh, here, the true believers are appearing, and that word appear is the word made manifest. We are being made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ in this time or day of judgment, and God is a just judge. The Lord Jesus is the judge of all the earth, and here come a great multitude that he has saved before him, like all the rest of mankind. It's as though everyone comes before him. But but the elect, the elect, he looks at differently. He, he looks at every person, whether they have done good or bad, and all of those that do not have a Savior, they're in their sins, and, and so he sees bad, and he condemns them and punishes them. But when he looks at the elect, he sees no sin, because all their sin were laden upon Christ from the foundation of the world. So uh, even though they're sinners and and we still sin in body, yet every time we sin, even if we sin today, if we sin a minute ago, that sin too was laid upon Christ from the foundation of the world and paid for. And so the judge of all the earth does not see it. He, he looks, and yet he sees no sin. And, and yet, we're going through the entire period of judgment uh, as the unsaved are, and at the end of the period, we will endure to the end, and and that's because there's no sin upon us, and finally, at the final result of the judgment on the wicked will be their destruction, their annihilation, but God's people will be found innocent. We will be found good to have done good due to all sin being removed from us. And and that's what is in view by that language. Thank you, Chris. God bless you, Bible Fellowship. You're welcome. Thank you for calling and uh, bringing up that verse and your question. Let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome Uh, um, to our Monday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good evening, Chris. Could you please read a Second Peter three ten through thirteen? Uh, I actually read it from uh, J P Green's interlinear, but if you want to read it from there, that would be fine. Second Peter three verse ten says, "But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise." And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Yeah, through 13. Oh, through 13? Okay. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, 
looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Okay, I was talking to, with some friends today regarding these three verses in you know, St. Peter and uh, chapter 3, and they indicated to me, which uh, obviously I don't, don't, I don't believe that, that especially verse uh, 13, because of the language of verse 13, that is being interpreted by them as a renewal of the earth and not a destruction and a recreation of a new earth as we read in Revelation 21. Could you please explain more on that? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why people have a problem with God destroying uh, this sin-cursed earth. Um, it, it said back in verse 10 of Second Peter 3, in the day of the Lord, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. That seems to be uh, very direct, very straightforward. God is saying his plan is to destroy the earth. It, it's um, actually a necessity because the earth is corrupt. God uh, brought corruption upon the earth and the heavens at the time that man fell into sin and man became corrupt. Well, the corrupt man could not rule and have dominion over a perfect creation, so God brought corruption into the entire creation. And God's plan to correct this is at the end of the world, he will destroy the heavens and the earth. Everything that he spoke to create at the beginning, he will speak, or however he'll do it, and and um, quickly, it, it, you know, God is all-powerful, almighty, and uh, he could just will it to be, or speak it to be, and it could be done just like that, with a snap of the finger, and this whole creation is gone, burned up in, in a fervent heat. And, and the works therein, I think, uh, are referring to men, to people, that are burned up, the wicked are burned up with it, uh, as Isaiah says, that God will destroy the, the heavens and, and they that dwell therein will die in like manner. I think it says that in Isaiah 51. And, and so that will be the annihilation of all the unsaved and, and the annihilation of this creation. Nothing that has been infected with sin may continue into the new heaven and new earth. And, and so then God will speak and recreate a new heaven and new earth. Then it, it will be uh, created and made to match the, the new creation that the people of God will be as they receive their new resurrected bodies, which are a spiritual body, and... And, and so somehow God's going to create an earth that will uh, be meet for their existence, for God's people's existence in their, their new form, as they are now complete, totally new creatures in both body and soul. And, and there'll be, I'm sure, new creatures. God will, will create all kinds of new creatures that are... Uh, design to be a part of that new earth, not like cats and dogs and squirrels and elephants and insects and things like that, that were designed to inhabit this earth. They go with this earth. They were made of uh, the dust of the ground, just as man was made of the dust of the ground. The creatures were made of the elements of the ground. 
and and that's why uh, we find the same elements that are in the ground in the the animals, and and so uh, with a new creation, however, God will create that. The creatures will be equipped and qualified to live in that creation. And, um, I don't know why anybody wants to hold on to anything, anything from this world, uh, hold on to anything from this creation. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know why anybody would think that it could be some kind of problem for God to completely remove this creation. Now, remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. It says in verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made as those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So God there is telling us his plan is to shake the earth as well as the heaven and to remove it, to to just uh, make it disappear. And that's what Revelation 21.1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So God uh, isn't going to use this earth in, in any way at all, uh, except in the sense of, of a figure uh, where he will make a new earth, um, uh, just like he gives us a new heart. Did, did he use our old heart, that, that evil heart of unbelief, that heart of stone, uh, did he use the substance of our soul to make the new heart within us? No, he just took it out. I'll take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He removes the one and he gives the other. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's more of a denial on their part. And, and they cannot conceive that, uh, that's what they were saying, they cannot conceive that uh, a merciful God that created such a beautiful world will destroy it. They just cannot conceive that, so they don't accept even Revelation 21. I went there also, but they don't accept that. Yes, but well, I, I think so. it's just mm -hmm. uh, short-sightedness on anyone's part uh, to look at this world, and yes, it's beautiful and, and, and full of wonders in the creation, and uh, I, I know we, we see some of these creatures and and we do stand amazed at what god can do in his creative ability and yet it, it would be limiting god limiting the holy one of israel to think that he can't just simply do away with all this and make something a hundred a thousand times better um you know god is capable uh, remember what he would say when israel would sin well, I'll just destroy these people, and I'll uh, and I'll make um, people from the rocks or or something like that. And God has ability and power, and the capability to do things exceedingly above anything we could imagine or think. And I think it's just man's little finite mind. That, that sees what he sees and, and he can't or doesn't want to look beyond that and, and to allow God to be God and, and to trust that what God does will, will certainly be much better than uh, our understanding. Uh, you know, people think of heaven. Heaven's a place where there's dogs and cats and, and all the creatures from this world and and they picture heaven basically as a serene earth with, with um, nice grassy fields and beautiful flowers and quiet streams. That's their idea of heaven because they can't rise above this earth. They really want the earth. They don't want, they don't want heaven. But God's people, we, we know that God knows best and we trust him for all that he'll do. But thank you 
for calling and sharing. And okay. let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Monday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Galatians uh, chapter 5, uh, right around verse 20 on, it talks about uh, the works of the flesh or you know, fornication, adultery, murder, you name it. And then you see in verse 22 of Galatians 5 that the fruits of the Spirit, which are really the works of God or of Christ, are imputed into us, like in Ezekiel 36, and that's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faith. So uh, it's all God, and I just confirmed what she was talking about a little bit, but we know it's God who worketh in us to uh, do all these good works, which are the fruits of the Spirit, if you will. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that Facebook, uh, eBible Fellowship Facebook, and uh, eBible.com, et cetera, are, are very good. You've really put up a lot of posts there. Um, the question I had tonight was in Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. Genesis 32, verse 24 says, um, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when we go to verse 30, please. All uh, right. And Jacob called the name of the place, Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Well, would this confirm that uh, since he wrestled with a man, that it, that was Christ at that time, because Christ is the only man of the Godhead, and it was God, as we read in verse 30. Just just threw that out. Yes, yes, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, th okay, this is a historical... Uh, record of a time when Jacob wrestled with a man. Now, whether he had a vision or however it worked out, there there was the Lord God making an appearance as a man. Theologians term that a theophany, and and not in the sense that Christ entered into the world and was born of the Virgin and became man, but God making an appearance as a man, and he wrestled with Jacob, and the wrestling match was over being blessed, as it says in verse 26, and he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And this is actually typical of God. Now, when, when we, now that we understand that this whole wrestling match is over being blessed or not, we can see that that relates to salvation. And, and as far as salvation is concerned, the Bible tells us that none seeketh after God in Romans 3. And, and that is, none seeketh after God in a right way according to the commandments of God or, or according to the proper way of seeking him. Many seek after God after their own desires, their own ideas, their own religion, or their own gospel, but that is not true seeking after God. And yet, despite the fact that none of the human race truly seek God, yet God draws certain ones, his elect, to himself. And uh, this would have been during the time of the day of salvation. God would draw um, people like Jacob, and Jacob is used as a figure of the elect elsewhere, to himself, and then, it, in a sense, a wrestling match would ensue. During this time, the individual who was predestinated to salvation from before the foundation of the world had not yet been redeemed, had not yet become saved, and and so he is he is wrestling with God over blessing, bless me, and and often during this time it's as though God does not want to give the blessing, and and is actually trying to discourage the person, and uh, this would work out in various ways, but we know that God often does that where 
uh, he he says something that is discouraging to someone um, that is seeking him, like the woman uh, who who wanted the Lord Jesus to heal her daughter, and Christ said, "It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs." A very discouraging statement, and designed in a sense, like it says here, to let me go, let me go, and and uh, I I won't give you the blessing. But the woman persisted. Why did she persist? Because she was one of God's elect, and the Lord was actually drawing her, and in the drawing process, which is actually a violent action, the word drawing is a word that identifies with force, God would not let the one he was drawing go. And uh, so it, it's it's just interesting how, on one hand, God actively does things to discourage the individual that he himself has drawn to him, and on the other hand, he will not allow that person to go back to the world or go back uh, from wherever they came from. He holds them until they receive the blessing, and th- and that is the wonderful thing about the drawing aspect of God's salvation program. It it, it was guaranteed because God was the one basically with his hand around the collar of the individual, no matter how they kicked and screamed, and and they just didn't like what was happening to them, and they, they longed and desired to get away. They did not go back. But they continued on reading the Bible, continued on praying, continued on seeing their sin and struggling day after day after day until God blessed them and and God saved them. And it was all the grace of God. So, yes, historically, God could have um, just just thrown Jacob in a second away and and been done with him, but it's painting a wonderful picture of God allowing Jacob to fight with him over the blessing, because it it really describes spiritually what has taken place in the lives of uh, many of God's elect throughout time. But thank you for bringing up these verses, and... We, we don't have anyone else on the phone right now, so we'll end our time together here. I would like to thank everyone for sharing and for uh, bringing up the Bible verses and your questions and comments that you did. It's always a blessing as we can spend some time in the Word of God and consider what the Lord has said to us. But we've come to the end of our time tonight. And if possible, please join us Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time till 10.30 in our Facebook Sunday Q&A group. It is called the Sunday Q&A group, but it's on Wednesday, and all are welcome to join us then. But for now, say good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these questions and answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.